to the Cross Border Interviews with Christopher Brown. I am your host, Christopher Brown, and we are back with our Community Spotlight, where we shine a spotlight on one of the great organizations here in the city of Calgary. And today I'm honored and proud to have the founder, and I'm going to make sure I read this off correctly so I make sure I get the entire name correct, right? The founder of the Pregnancy, Infant, and Child Loss Support Center, uh, Aditi Loveridge. Aditi, thank you so much for doing this. This is an honor and a pleasure to have you on the show. Oh, thank you. It's my it's my honor, my privilege. Thank you. So, Aditi, I want to ask the the question that's on everyone's mind, and that is, who is and what is the Pregnancy Infant Child Loss Support Center? Well, I'm going to make it a little easier for you, Chris, because um, uh, that is our legal name, Pregnancy, yeah. Infant, and Child Loss <laughs> Support Center. <laughs> We are known in the community more as Pregnancy and Infant Loss Support Center. Um, we still do we still do have the child loss and we do child loss support, but it's not as um, prominent. So um, so that is that is who we are, Pregnancy and Infant Loss Support Center. Um, what the question was? What do we do? Who was are you? Who are you? Who what are, are we? You? Oh my gosh! So let's get oh let's get right so to the we, beginning. Who are you? What is your organization yeah. about? And I I mean that nicely because we might have people tuning in right now thinking, who is this organization? What do they do for our community? What do they do for our province? So who is totally. who are your organization? Totally. So um, we are a registered charity. We're based in Calgary, Alberta. Um, however, COVID-19 gave us, I think the only positive thing that has come out of COVID-19 um, has been the, we gave us the ability to pivot our service delivery model. So when we first opened um, in 2019, we were very focused on Calgary-based um, support and COVID-19 came and suddenly everybody shut down. We have no and we were thinking, what do we do? Um, and we were able to quickly um, and creatively pivot our programs to be offered remote and even started uh, new programming to meet that kind of need. Um, and so now we are reaching um, everywhere across Alberta, as well as Canada. We have a chapter in Ontario as well. Um, and we are basically, we serve and support any person um, who is impacted by miscarriage, stillbirth, neonatal death, um, SIDS, so sudden infant death syndrome, um, infertility, termination for medical reasons, um, post-abortion, anybody who is impacted by basically the loss of pregnancy in all its forms. Um, we will support you through a bunch of different programs. So we've got a helpline, support groups, professional one-to-one -one coaching and counseling. Um, and then we've got a siblings and loss program. So just an abundance of different options and, ver and varieties. And um, since we've been offering our supports remotely, we've seen a huge increase in clients accessing our support, particularly from remote and rural uh, areas in Alberta, because there isn't support everywhere, um, like in your major kind of hub cities, or even in like Medicine Hat, Lethbridge, there's still like not a lot of um, pregnancy and infant loss support. Um, what else can I tell you about us? We are no cost. That is one thing I want to say right off the bat is that all of our services are at no cost based on um, the funding and donations we're able to secure. I want to talk about the beginning because this, this, the organization, the charity did not just start and then happen. Oh. What was the no. need that, because as the founder, you saw a need in the community that wasn't being addressed. And I, I don't want to touch on anything that is personal if you don't want to talk about it, but was there an incident or was there a, a moment where you saw that this was a needed service within our community because it wasn't being offered to uh, everyone, and I say everyone as inclusively as possible, because I understand that fathers have to deal with the loss of a child as well, brothers, sisters, mm -hmm. aunts, uncles, grandparents, the mother, everyone has to deal with it and has to uh, grieve in their own way. So what was it, that moment that made you think, I need to offer this type of service to the community because I don't see uh, it happening right now? 
Yeah, and you're right, right? Like I did not wake up one morning and decide, oh, this is, I'm gonna create this, this space and the center. It's absolutely based on um, my personal journey and and then of course my professional journey. But um, so it wasn't one moment, I think it was a series of many, um, many moments that life and the universe um, kind of guided me towards, but, um, when I so my background, my educational background is in social work, and so I, I used to work um, in women's, uh, primarily women's sexual health. Um, and then during that time, my partner and I decided we were going to try to start a family. I was one of those people that was like, mm, neither here nor there about children. Kind of was like, I don't even know if I want kids. Um, but then we decided to to make the decision to try. And um, my first pregnancy um ended up being an ectopic pregnancy so um an ectopic pregnancy is a, a pregnancy that develops anywhere um outside of the person's uterus um usually in the fallopian tube and so it is a life-threatening um pregnancy and it's not one that you can save um i didn't even know that i was pregnant at the time i just i just knew something was kind of off i was having some pain anyways long story short um i ended up experiencing systemic racism when I went in for that first loss that left me almost to die a week later because of that I wasn't believed by some by one particular um, healthcare provider um, and so I wasn't sure if I was pregnant found out I was pregnant and the next breath was told well actually we do think you're pregnant um, but we also think you're losing it. And in that moment, all I heard was you're pregnant. And I just remember feeling like, so like elated, like, wow. So I didn't know that I wanted to become a parent or a mom. And then when I finally heard those words, you are pregnant, I was like, wow, this really is something that I want. Um, and then I went through that extremely traumatic two weeks of, uh, had so much internal bleeding. It was a very traumatic experience. Um, and then had to deal with the fact that, okay, I was pregnant, didn't know I was pregnant. So I lost a, a baby that nobody knew about, including myself. Um, there was very, a lot of physical trauma. There was emotional trauma because of the way that I was treated and not believed and how much that could have been avoided. Um, and I just kind of was like dumbfounded. I was a social worker at the time working as a social worker. And so I was not, um, I was used to like speaking up, right? That was, that's, that's your job as a social worker, right? You, you put voice to those who don't, yeah. don't have a voice. That's sort of your role. And yet, um, I was completely silent, um, which I mean, now I know is like, that's a symptom of oppression, right? You're when you are being in that position of being oppressed, like it's, you're not going to speak up. Um, and so that situation kind of happened. Somehow I found the courage to try again. Got pregnant for a second time, um, ended up with a later loss again. Um, and then again for the third time. I don't know how, honestly, I found the courage to, get, to continue to go, but somewhere I, I just that desire of like wanting that baby now that I knew really was what I wanted uh, kept me going and got pregnant for a third time um, with my now living, living child um, who's going to be nine this summer. Um, that pregnancy with my living child took me by surprise. It completely blindsided me. Um, I thought, you know, okay, you're pregnant now, um, further than you've made it, and everything should be okay. And everything was not okay. I was so disconnected. I was so anxious. Um, I just could not settle into the fact that I might be bringing a baby home. Um, I, my mind just could not allow myself to go into safety of like you are going to bring a child home um and that trickled in to my postpartum period so after i had my kiddo i i experienced severe postpartum anxiety um um for a long for a much long period of time well after um his first birthday um and it wasn't talked about so there was supposed there were some supports when I first initially had my initial loss. There was uh, there was supports. Um, there were one type of support, 
it was go talk to this other social worker. Now, at the time I was a social worker, I, it, not to say that that's not what people need. Absolutely, people need different things. But that was what I realized was people need different things. Yeah. I needed something different. I don't know what I needed then, but I knew I needed something different. And then nobody was talking about when I was pregnant. Everyone just kept looking at me. Oh, yay, you're happy. You're blah, blah, blah. And I was like, this, I am like, this is the most intense ride I've ever been on. And I felt so completely isolated. Um, and I was blindsided because I was like, is this just me? Like, am I the only person who is, <laughs> you know, navigating pregnancy after loss and terrified because I'm seeing in the media all these people that are blissfully um, pregnant and happy and doing it what I thought was the right way. Um, turns out that I wasn't alone. <laughs> Well, I'm so, um, I, I have a lot to digest with your, your, your statement there, because yeah. I want to, I want to get to the fact that people going through individuals going through the loss of an infant of a pregnancy often, like you said, find themselves alone, particularly in rural communities, in remote communities where they don't have the access, the easy access to uh, social workers, to healthcare system that is open 24 seven. Mm -hmm. Let's be honest, our province isn't the best when it comes to remote healthcare. Um, mm -hmm. What can people do who are in this position that you were in when they're trying to figure out I, I feel so alone right now. And I know you're going to say contact our organization because we're great and we can help you. But what's the first step for those who, who might listen to this and go, I'm struggling right now. Like yourself, I I'd potentially lost two children before I had my third. And I can imagine having that third in the back of your head is, is it going to happen again? Is it going to happen again? Because I've heard mm -hmm. from stories from family members from across the, the country saying, you, you lose an infant. You always have that in the back of your head. So what, mm -hmm. what would you tell people who are out there right now struggling, who are trying to find the resources that your, your organization so awesomely provide to not just people here in Calgary, but across Alberta and even Canada? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good question. And you're right. Of course, I'm going to be like, well, reach out to us. Of course. <laughs> but before you can get <laughs> before you can even get to that point. Um, and if I put myself back, you know, this was 10 years ago, my second loss was 10 years ago. So if I put myself back in though in that place, I think my advice uh, I hate to give advice but my insight would be to to get honest um when I say get honest I mean really get real with yourself about how you're feeling number one don't feel like there's something wrong with you um there is nothing wrong with you um it's society we don't talk about this enough like the truth of, of how, how impactful this experience is. So I would say, get honest with yourself. And if you're struggling, then start to get honest then with other people, start to tell other people about how you're feeling um, because you likely will encounter other people who can relate to you even before you enter a point where you're gonna meet the community that we've built. But I think it's really powerful to just get vulnerable and real and say like first with yourself, Cause I don't think I was because I just felt like something was wrong with me. Why, why am I, why can't I get through this? What's, what's going on? Had I think in hindsight, had I been real with myself and started to open myself up maybe to those people that were closest to me, um, perhaps I wouldn't have felt so isolated. I mean, at the time there wasn't, there wasn't a charity like ours, but even that, I think like just that knowing that you're not alone, even when others can, just offer some words of comfort, I think is really powerful. When, when the organization was starting out, was it well received? And, and I say that by, by meaning this, I can imagine a lot of people don't like talking and I, I come from a generation of you don't talk about your emotions, you bottle them up and you, you try to deal with them yourself. And that's just the way I was raised. And I'm not like that now. My husband will attest to that. I will put that out there right now. But I can imagine 
when trying to have that conversation, that difficult conversation in an open setting where people are willing to talk one-on-one -on -one with somebody, it's hard to find people who are willing to open up and start growing the community so that way you can have resources across the province. So when you mm -hmm. were starting out and starting at looking at an idea of a charity in the realm of pregnancy and infant loss, was it hard at first? And then it slowly got easier as more people started opening up and talking about what they were going through at the time. So when I started the charity, I like, so I transitioned out of social work and I became a coach based on me um, supporting a dear friend of mine through her, um, her own, um, her own loss. I, I supported her in that friend role. And so when I started to see her kind of ask same questions and feel similar ways that I was feeling, I was like, oh, Hey, it wasn't just me it, and and then it, it's not just her and so I started my coaching business and through that coaching business I started to have like I got one client two clients many clients and it started to like grow and so I decided like you know what these people need to meet <laughs> like we all need to connect and so I said why don't we all get together whoever wants whoever's been who's experienced loss on the path to parenthood, whatever that looks like, why don't we get together for a social kind of connection group? And I started to host those. And as I started to listen to the group, yeah, I started to see there were still so many gaps in the support system. Um, there was people that were like, like myself, more years removed from the initial loss, but wanted to stay in touch with the community. There was people that were pregnant again, so they didn't know where they, where they fit in. And there was just all these people that were wanting to connect but didn't have a space to do so. So when I founded the center, um, I think that it came a little bit easier, like people, because people had already become accustomed to talking to me. People had already become accustomed to this notion of like, oh, like this is what a DD provide like this space is what a DD provides. I, the social group was very like low key. I said, you can come, you can talk about your losses, or you can talk about the Kardashians, like whatever, whatever you want to talk about. There's no pressure to come and like share your story. It wasn't, it wasn't a support group. It was a connection group. And through that, um, that was really the time when that connection group started to grow, where I met Dr. Stephanie Cooper, and I, I who's a high risk OBGYN um, here in Calgary. Um, who we had shared client and patients and she she reached out and said I want to know what you're doing because people are my client my patients are talking about you and I want to know what, what it is that you do you're supporting them and what is it so then at that meeting I told her this idea which is now the center and she was like yes that is needed and so that really was the push for me um, to take that leap of faith and build the center because I had all of these people who I could see there was the need. Um, I got confirmation from a healthcare, not only from like the community, but from the healthcare uh, side of it to say, yes, we would love to have a resource that we could like refer um, our patients to. And so that kind of gave me that push. Um, it really started to snowball more though. I knew it was a need, the community knew it was a need, everyone knew it was a need when it launched. Um, I didn't realize how much of a need, honestly, that it was until we opened because then it really just like snowballed and and then COVID hit and we got some funding to have our services for free. And we saw a 300% increase in clients accessing that first year in 2020. And so to answer your question, I don't think that people felt like it was hard. I think what people um, needed was a tangible and visible space to talk about that hard because that's what was missing before. Like when I worked as a social worker, I saw there was a cause and a charity for everything, literally everything. There was like, you know, pets, like there's cats, charities for cats. There's like, there's charities for literally everything. And yet there was not a community-based charity for pregnancy and infant loss. And I honestly felt like that in itself was silencing the community. So it wasn't that people were afraid to talk about the hard, it was that there was no place to talk about it, if that oh, makes sense. It does, and I appreciate your answer on that. I want to talk about the launch of the organization because you, you've said it a few times. 
you you launch COVID-19 hits. <laughs> so it's not the grand opening that most people would envision of, hey, we can get our legs, sea legs underground. It's you launch and then you have a pandemic that has turned everything virtual. Um, take me through that process of how you transition from those one on like those group settings where you're able to talk in person, whether it be about loss or whether it be about the Kardashians, and then moving <laughs> them onto a more virtual playing field. Because while we are connected virtually, that human connection, especially in this type of setting, does go a long way. And particularly when you're talking about um, very heavy uh, things like loss, I can imagine the virtual setting is kind of harder to grapple with but also dissect and talk about and open up when you're talking to a computer screen in some sense yeah it's interesting so we we actually we launched 2019 we had a full year under our belt but we didn't have any funding <laughs> we you know it was like me it was me i didn't really have like a full proper board or no funding and so we were still like working on a kind of like a sliding scale and and, and we i didn't have other people really helping outside of me um then i started to get that help and then 2020 came okay. pandemic hit and so we still we had a we had a presence and a client base but not to the capacity that we do now um and so when 2020 hit I was like, am I allowed to swear on it on this podcast? Oh, go go for it. We've had okay. people smoke. We've had politicians <laughs> smoke sure. weed and drink alcohol on this. So go ahead. I just wasn't sure because sometimes I'm like, oh, because sometimes there's just no other word. But I, when the pandemic hit, I was like, oh shit! Like all of this hard work that we've been building, like we've been building this beautiful community, and now we can't see each other. Like, how, what's going to happen? And so that is where our helpline stemmed in because i started really racking my brain like how can we still get people connected to peers to other people going through this um while people are at home and so we we ended up getting funding for to launch our helpline um which is a text and web-based uh, helpline and then from there we were like okay now we need to move our, our groups we can't hold our groups and there are peer support groups we need to move them remote. And so we did a ton of work, a ton of training with our volunteers to to make sure that it was um, a safe, welcoming space as much as you can virtually. And actually what we now, what I know looking back um, two years ago is some organizations I think saw a decrease because of that. Like you said, that online kind of connection, it's hard to foster that. And it, it is. And on the other side of it, our entire mandate is to reduce barriers. And one of those barriers really has to do with grief. When people are grieving, when people are living in, with trauma, they naturally isolate themselves. They naturally withdraw. So again, when I look back 10 years ago to when I had my loss, going to an in-person group, just getting there, would have prevented me from getting there for quite some time, I think. It takes a lot of courage and a lot of childcare and all of these other barriers, uh, but mainly that courage um, to actually go. So what being remote did and continues to do for us is it is really saying, you're having a hard grief day. You don't have to be on camera. You can be in your pajamas, you can be in bed, you can have uh, like ice cream next to you you can have your cats your whatever makes you feel safe in your space and you can come so literally come as you are and i think that that has been the pivotal moment and really for me it has changed how we operate and how we will continue to operate moving forward you talked about how during the pandemic, your organization kind of blew up. More people were accessing it. You, you said you had over 300% increase in uh, mm -hmm. users coming in. Um, you talked about it briefly there for a few seconds about the isolation that COVID-19 did affect. I, I would say a lot of people, I wouldn't say all of us, but there was a lot of people mm -hmm. who felt an emotional toll of being locked inside when mm -hmm. dealing with a loss in this matter, whether it be a mother, a father, or anyone, 
how important is it to reach how how important is it for uh, people to reach out to get that support because like you said that first step is always the hardest like whenever i whenever i've gone to support groups i've always the hardest part is walking through the door right actually getting mm-hmm. up and walking through the door like you said there may be barriers around it how does your organization come in and help and reach out and say you know what we're going to extend the olive branch as well whether you you might not know that they're struggling but someone might refer someone to you and do you reach out to them or how does that initial contact work? Is it, is it always the, I don't want to say customer because it's not a customer, but is it always the, the person reaching out to your organization or is it vice versa? Yeah, that's a really good question. So one of our like key values that we hold is accessibility. Um, And so for accessibility, to me, that means like reducing as many barriers to support as possible. So our referral system um, is there is none. (laughs) So you can go on our website and you can book in with a counselor or coach. You can book in for a peer group. You can email us if you have questions. You can text our helpline. You can do that by yourself if you've come across us or we're giving us our name um a family member could just say i've heard of this person and send send the the web um the website over um because i really find that when people are grieving um the more steps are gr- there's a thing called and i don't know chris if you've heard of it but there's literally a thing known in the community as grief brain where we'll talk about here in a few seconds if you don't mind too <laughs> yeah yeah, because I, because, like, I, because I don't think like I might understand it. And let's be honest, I, I probably know it's like one percent of what you know in the grand scheme of thing. But what is grief brain for my listeners who are listening and think, OK, she's just thrown a word out that I don't know what you're talking about. So what is grief brain? Yeah, grief brain is this is this notion that when we experience loss um, uh, or tr- loss of any kind, so grief of any kind, um, it literally has impacts on our brain. So our brain function literally decreases. So we may have harder time remembering words or remembering appointments, or um, we just have, it's like fogginess, kind of like this brain fog. Things, tasks, simple tasks can be harder when we have grief brain. And so for me, as a founder of an organization supporting those that are navigating grief, why would I make the process more difficult than it needs to be. It needs to be as simple as possible. Because when I say accessibility, that's what I mean. Like it's not only, okay, we have remote and it's free, it's how easily can grieving people access. The barriers to access a resource like yours is there's a lot of different barriers that you would have to deal with. And I want to talk about one in particular before I I ask my next question here. We're communicating in English right now. Now, Mm -hmm. you and I both know that Calgary is not just an Anglophile community. We have, I live up in the Northeast. We are a very diverse community up here. We have lots of different backgrounds, different languages, different cultures. Do you break down those barriers as well? Do you have people, resources on standby that if someone uh, of a Sikh uh, background comes in and says, I'd like to talk to someone to deal with my loss of my child, are those barriers in place as well that you're able to break down so that way everyone and all Canadians, I'm going to say Canadians in the grand scheme because your organization is a Canadian-based organization, um, that they can actually access the programs as well? Yes, absolutely. So one of our um, key foundational values of ours is um, diversity and equity. I don't like to use the word inclusion, um, but diversity and equity. So providing an equitable space for all people impacted by loss. So if you've noticed through this whole whole conversation, I'm not talking about moms and dads and women and men. I'm talking about people um, because there's trans people, there's non-binary folks who also experience loss on the path to parenthood. Anybody within their reproductive years who's trying to build a family can and will um, experience loss on the path to parenthood. That also includes people from diverse cultural backgrounds and also like different faiths. Me as a woman of color, as I shared my my story of the systemic racism, I always felt 
after my loss that there wasn't necessarily pl a place for me. Because you're right, language, culture, there's so many barriers um, when we really look at the unique people that are navigating this journey. And so, um, yeah, we have, we have um, a Punjabi speaking support group in partnership with the Punjabi Community Health Services, also funded by one of our board members, um, who is Punjabi, who also lost a da her daughter um, to stillbirth. Um, so she has, with her family and friends, fundraised to make that program happen. We do have access with our, um, through our professional counseling and coaching program to translators. So people that feel more comfortable or do, or English is not their first language, that they can actually connect in a language that is appropriate um, for them. We would love to see more of that on the helpline. That takes more funding because it's not as easy as, okay, yes, we'll offer it to everyone, to all. There's also like everything costs money and so is a charity, but that is a, one of our like foundational missions is how do we make it as accessible to all of the people um, so yeah, it's something that we're always, always thinking through, considering shifting, changing, um, and trying to do better. We have spent about 35 minutes, and I have not asked the one question I should have asked at the very beginning of this episode, which is, yeah. how can people contact you? We've talked about, oh, they can go to our website, they can, they can contact us, but I've never asked actually, how can people <laughs> contact you? Because I think that's an important part of the step here. And once uh, Aditi does say it, we will link it in the show notes. So all the links uh, that Aditi mentions here will be in the show notes. So she doesn't have to list off everything, like the actual spelling yes. of everything, just, just how can people reach out to you? Yeah, I think best place to reach out is our website, um, uh, pilsk.org, um, which you'll which you'll link, um, and also Instagram. Lots of fo like folks are finding us on Instagram. We're Pregnancy Loss Support Canada um, on Instagram, and then of course, if you're wanting to connect and learn more about us, we are having a fundraiser uh, legacy run walk in Airdrie on June twelfth. Um, Danae from Virgin Radio is our host, and we also will have a beverage garden um, hosted by Marta Loop Brewery. Um, so it's going to be a great day. So even if you are not personally impacted by the cause, but want to see what our community is about, see what the community is about, see what our work is about, um, that'd be a great opportunity to come and support in a, in a fun after morning, I guess. Well, I will be there for sure because it's the day after my walk that I have to do for my, uh, the foundation that I support. So I will be there to come oh, out amazing. and show my support for you as well. Um, but back back to the story because I don't want to make I don't want to make my listeners feel like that's the end of the show because usually <laughs> I wrap up by telling people where to go and to find out more information. But I just want to make sure people know that that information is there. Um, I want to talk about the future, and that's the big thing. And while we from we can like we said off in our pre-interview we could probably spend like 12 hours here and just <laughs> chat and just dis dissect dis dissect this information i want to talk about actually before i do that i would i do want to apologize I, I i i under i heard what you said aditi and i and i did not mean to be uh uh, rude or disrespectful to anyone who's going through any person who is going through this. Um, I, during these shows, I like to learn. And I agree that we need to be equitable to everyone who is going through this, whether it be uh, male, female, non-binary, transgendered, everyone. And I do apologize because I, 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 when you said that, I was like, I, do, I did say that a few times, didn't I? So I do apologize. And please don't hold it against me for uh, no, trying to I, learn. I love here. that. <laughs> I love that. I love that you that you acknowledge that, number one, because that that is my that has always been my mission in talking about it. And the way that I speak about it is to start to change the narrative around pregnancy and infant loss. Um, and so I love that you said that. So I will not hold it against you. I think that's awesome. Thank but you. I want to talk about that for a few minutes here, because when when like myself, the the I don't want to say average, but the person in rural Alberta or rural Canada or downtown Calgary might think that pregnancy and infant loss is a woman's issue. But mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're breaking down that barrier and you're saying, no, it's not just a woman's issue. It's a people mm -hmm. issue. It's, it's people everyone's issue. issue. Why yeah. is that important to break down that barrier? Because some people, and I'm just, I'm not trying to play devil's advocate here. I just want to get your reaction to this, but 
people might say it's a woman's issue and that's it. So we don't need to, men don't need to talk about it. Non-binary, transgender people don't like to talk about it. But from someone who's been in the organ, in, in the realm for a few years now, why is it important to break down that barrier? Oh, that's such a big question. Um, I think when you, I think at the, at the heart of it, it's about, yes, primarily, primarily it's a women's issue. Primarily, I can, I can say that. And if we only ever talk about it in that sense, then we are leaving out, we are excluding, we are forgetting that so many people are impacted by pregnancy and infant loss. So many, the birthing person, their partners, and then it's sending that message again that they are not welcome in this space, in this dialogue, in this conversation, in this healing work, right? So partners, um, if you do identify as non-binary, then, oh, you're not like, oh, you're not a woman? Okay, well, then you don't really deserve support, right? So it's not, so a lot of people have said, well, using gender inclusive language, Aditi, isn't that erasing women? And to me, it's like, no, it's not erasing women. It's acknowledging that there's also other people who go through this. And I'm all about like, if we are providing equitable spaces, which we all should be striving towards, then we do have to change the narrative. We do have to change the language. It has, we, everybody should be represented in this space because families come in all shapes and all sizes. Um, and if we're only representing a certain type, then we are leaving out a large portions of Albertans and Canadians and humans. <laughs> Do you have a large, diverse uh, clientele, not clientele, I hate using the word clientele because do you have a do you have a lot of people, different backgrounds who make up uh, the great diversity that is our uh, our province and our country using your organization? And I, I say that with respect because I just want to know, like, if a father or a man out there, and I say I say man just because I just want to, I'm going to stick to the uh, male gender here for a second. Yeah. If, a, if a man goes into your organization, say, my my wife was just law for, or my my husband and I were just uh, trying for uh, uh, in vitro in vitro fertilization. We lost the child. Can I use your organization? Do you have people mm -hmm. across the spectrum coming in and using your organization? Absolutely, and it's because of that piece of diversity that we bring. Our our support groups. Um, we don't just have one support group. We divide them up into different categories. So we actually do have a male and male identifying partners in loss group. We have an LGBTQ to 2S LGBTQ plus um, group. Um, we have a post-abortion group. We have a termination for medical reasons group. We have no matter, we break it down so that families can find a space that really is represented of them. And so we we do, I, I, I'm not gonna sit here and say we are, we are so diverse. I mean, we are in Calgary, Alberta, okay? <laughs> First of all, okay. So, <laughs> so yes, we have diversity, but if I ever come to you, Chris, and say, yes, we have the most diverse clients and we're doing it right, then I'm doing it wrong. Um, this is something that will forever be a part of our work and something that we will continuously strive to do. Um, do we have diversity? Yes. Could we have more? Absolutely. And I hope that in the future that we just continue to to grow that, a, a very diverse space that's reflective of of the, the people that are going through pregnancy and infant loss. You've talked about breaking down the barriers a lot during this interview, and I want to know, how do you break down the barriers of getting this issue more of a people issue than a women's issue? Because again, and yet again, I'm just going back because I, I grew up in rural Ontario, so I am not the poster child for anything that should be like the fact that I'm gay. That's like the biggest accomplishment in our hometown. <laughs> it's like, oh God, a gay guy's in our hometown. Yay. We can put the pride flag up. Um, right. I, I want to know, how do we get people to start having the conversation and say, this is, this should not just be a, and I get that your organization's there, but how do we get the conversation started on a national stage? And if you understand where I'm mm -hmm. going, this is going to transition to Bill 17 here in a few yeah. seconds. But how yeah. do we start having that conversation and getting more people to realize that it's okay to 
feels struggling or to struggle after a, a, a life altering event like this? Mm -hmm. I think it's about honestly I'm going to go back to like that real that vulnerability piece that getting real and honest and having people are um, people like vulnerable myself. though can people be vulnerable because I can imagine there's a I barrier think, that they put up when they walk in because they don't want to seem too or do they come in and or use your services and just have that barrier down because they actually want to have that conversation with somebody and that's why they've reached out yeah that's a good question I think that um yeah, I'm going to say, I mean, people are unique. So there's some people that come in very vulnerably and some that come in a little more close. But I think that people are more um, likely to feel safe um, when they're in a space that feel safe right yeah. so we have to like foster safety across and I think that's why people do enter our space for many people not all people many people enter our space feeling safe because we're we are hopefully setting that stage up even before they actually connect to us um but I think like that honestly is the key is like to not shy away from the conversations Right. The, like I said, we this has been pregnancy and infant loss has been an issue for I mean for millions of years. There's no cure because there's no there's no cause. It just happens sometimes. There's not a cure. Um, the numbers are increasing. Pandemic has increased the number of stillbirths and people. It, it's and yet there was nothing out there. There was no support out there. People weren't having the conversation. So I think the more that we can have the conversation, the more. And, and have it from this kind of lens of having diverse stories, like not just diversity in people, but diverse stories of, well, I had a termination for medical reasons. So I had like so every story is unique. And the more that we tell our unique stories, the more we'll start to understand that we can't just have one blanket approach to pregnancy and infant loss. We can't have one blanket um, tool, I guess. If that makes sense. It, it does. And um, one of the ways that we can start having that conversations is by approaching the government and your organization mm -hmm. did that, if I'm not mistaken, back in late 2021, if, uh, if I'm correctly, yeah. to start the conversation. Yeah. Bill 17, uh, I want you to ex explain to me what happened before Bill? What was what was in, on the books before Bill 17 and why you decided to lobby the government and get the government to potentially start having this conversation about gr a bereavement leave for not just uh, a loss of a loved one? So it was actually um, MLA um, Jordan Walker um, out of Edmonton. He actually, he had a, it started as a private member's bill. So he, it was his bill. Um, and he actually reached out to us as key stakeholders um, to say this is what he's wanting to do as with a private member's bill is to amend the bereavement leave to include miscarriage and stillbirth. And so we had a few roundtable discussions with him and then it moved and it, I spoke um, I spoke to the committee. Um, and gave my recommendations. And at that point, I recommended, you know, a few different things. And then it became bill, then it became a government bill, um, which is now bill 17. And so when that bill kind of came out, it had that language of miscarriage and stillbirth. And for me, the language just was not inclusive to what we see in the community the diversity of experiences in the community. And it, and and my whole thing was, well then people, if they don't fall in between like miscarriage and stillbirth, let's say it is a termination for medical reasons or abortion or some other thing, because there's a lot, like I had an ectopic pregnancy. Um, yes, that could be considered a miscarriage, but if I just felt like it was really important to move away from um, the de definitions, because I always like to say, so empowering to allow people to define their own experiences. Um, and so we, I felt it was really important if this bill was really going to support the community and needed to support the diversity of the community and broaden, broaden that definition um, away from only miscarriage and stillbirth. Um, 
I don't think I actually answered your question. <laughs> no, but no, my, my question was basically how did it start, but you did talk about it, it was Jordan Walker. I want to yes, know very grateful when, for that. When, when you got that phone call or however they uh, Jordan contacted you, were you taken back that this was going to be a potentially a private member's bill and people wanted to talk about this issue and expand oh. the uh, definition so it's more in inclusive and more diverse and that way it addresses everyone's story instead of just one subsection of people that you have dealt with during your time with the or, or your charity yeah i was uh, yes it was i was super taken aback um and then when i met with him and you know he told me why he chose it just by like just by talking to people it was so humbling and I'm just still so grateful that somebody would have used their private members because it's very rare to get that opportunity and for him to use it um, like this and then to actually see it go through um, all the way was just incredible. I'm just super grateful for for a MLA Walker and then, you know, Minister Madhu for his team for sitting down and hearing our conversations and then the members of the NDP, like everybody had really open dialogue and conversation and it really felt like a nonpartisan um issue and it was really really just so validating um to see that happen because it really started to feel what i know is that it's not an it, it is a nonpartisan issue it's it's a human issue and it really felt like everybody could feel that there was a great sense of like this is just a human and the right thing to do what does this bill entitle now? For those who might not be paying attention as close as you were, because you're you're a stakeholder into this bill, uh, like myself, who have been who follows politics on a regular basis, what does this bill entitle, or not entitle? I shouldn't say entitle. Entitle sounds like a really really weird word to hear. But what does this bill give to the people of Alberta if they go through? a uh, miscarriage and uh, if they need to get an abortion, if they have other issues that are uh, life-threatening or if they lose an infant or a child, what does this bill uh, give? And that, it's a weird question. I apologize if I asked that weirdly, but I just want to know, no. how does this affect, well, that's the way I should have worded it, how does, how does this affect Albertans? Yeah, so this bill, so bereavement leave um, was the loss of a loved one. Now it says that bereavement leave also includes um, a, anybody that's had a pregnancy that ends, um, that at, like basically a pregnancy that ends outside of a live birth. So that can encompass many different types of pregnancy loss. Um, people will get three days unpaid um, job protected leave is essentially what this bill will include. So it is for me, a really, really good first step. I think there, like, frankly, I think there, there need, like, there needs to be more. But this is huge because I think fundamentally, for me, the biggest win here is that it's acknowledged under bereavement leave. What was the reaction from uh, your organization, but also from the stories that from the people who utilize your organization? I can imagine oh. a, a, a bill that passes like this. I, I'm assuming the very first thing you probably hear is I wish this was in place when I went through this because then for me, I had to go back to work literally the next day because I know people yeah. who have gone through loss and they had to go back to work the very next day and I just could not imagine. Yeah, we got lots of those, a lot of those messages <laughs> like I was at work and or I had to go back to work. So we got a lot of those messages um, for our team. It looked like me watching the debate, watching the debate and just obsessing over it all, all week and watching, you know, MLA Irwin and, and Minister Madhu and just the conversation in the back and forth, but having it be like so deeply discussed was just so like freaking awesome and incredible and like like just amazing and when it passed it looked like me calling my team and all of us uh all of us um on our team our brief parents and so it looked like a lot of tears and just crying and just relief and it felt like freaking good chris to just be like this was something 
it's just something so good and needed and right. Um, and I'm just so proud of, of, uh, like our organization for, 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 for helping being a stakeholder and to the government for, for putting this forward. I, I want to know this though, because I w I didn't know of your organization before this bill came down. I did not know mm -hmm. of who you were. I, I, if you walked up by the, on the same street as me, I probably would just walk by. Now I know you. I'll say hi. That'll be Th fun. <laughs> this, put, this 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 bill, in essence, has started that conversation that you were looking to start. And this goes full circle here, people. Full circle. If you've been paying attention. This has started a conversation now that people are willing to openly talk about, because like you said, when you have the government and the opposition talking about this issue in the, uh, the Legislative Assembly of Alberta, people are covering it in the news, people are having this conversation, people are reaching out to uh, news organizations like mine, are reaching out to you and saying, let's have a conversation about this. I can't, like, while it's great that the bill was passed, I can imagine the ramifications of just even talking about it has been even more wonderful than just the bill passing. Honestly, you're absolutely right. It's been mind blowing. That's why I said like even me watching obsessively while they were debating and um, it was so cool, like so amazing and just humbling and mind blowing to me to see like Emily Irwin talking about inclusivity and then Minister Madhu um, also saying like, yes, inclusivity is a big part and why we met with key stakeholder Didi Loveridge and actually having Minister Madhu in, in a news article say that like a big part of why the language was changed was, was due to that, to do those conversations. Um, that was it. When I started the center, when I started this work, I said to you at the beginning, I wanted to change the narrative and the fact that this was happening and happened. Um, I, yeah, like it's, it's, it's unbelievable. And so when you ask, like, how do we do it? I think this is how we, we, we persevere. We, we don't give up and, and, and we, we have the conversations. We continue to. I appreciate that. And I appreciate everything. Like I said a few times during the interview, I appreciate everything your organization does. But I want to leave on this question. We've talked a lot for the last almost hour on this topic, on your organization, on Bill 17. What else have I missed? What would you want the people who are listening to this, whether it be, and because I, I just looked at the stats earlier this weekend, so I, I know, whether it be in St. John's, Newfoundland, whether it be in Vancouver, whether it be right here in Calgary or in Slave Lake, Alberta, Whitehorse, what would you want them to know about your organization that we haven't talked about that you really want to make sure you hit home? I think um, that one in four families are going to experience pregnancy and infant loss. One in six couples are going to experience uh, infertility. SIDS is still the leading cause of death for children under a year old. Um, so whether you personally know someone um, or not, like the likelihood is you, somebody in your life has been impacted by pregnancy and infant loss. And the blessing of COVID-19 is that there is support available. Um, remote support, yes, can sometimes feel like a little bit like, oh we're not we're not together and yet when we are so much in the depths of grief or trauma um remote support and getting that support from your couch or your living room or your bed um can really be a lifeline and so if you're listening you're personally impacted um our organization is here you don't have to explain um anything about your journey or who you are you just need to come as you are and you will be held our team is incredible we're bereaved parents um, and we'll see you. And so if you know someone who's been through loss, send them our way because um, I'm very, I'm like very proud of the work that we do and the team that we have. So send them our way. We'll, we'll see them, we'll hold them. Well, Aditi, I wanna thank you so much for sitting down and chatting about your organization. You do wonderful work for our community. You do wonderful work for our province. And, and I'm gonna say this, you do wonderful work for our country because as an Ontario boy, now that I know that you have a, a, 
uh, chapter opening up in Ontario. I will be uh, promoting that in the next few episodes to let people know because we do have a strange yes. following in Ontario, especially in rural Ontario where I'm from. So they, I yes. know people who who struggle every day with loss. Yeah, and they're, they're out there doing the work and doing some fundraising events and uh, connect like social connection groups out there. So yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Um, like I said, literally halfway through the interview, the links to the, I'm going to say the entire name, the entire legal name here, just because I want to make sure I get it off. The Pregnancy Infant Child Law Support Center, the website, Instagram, all their links and contact information will be in the show notes. If you're listening to this on the, In Your Car Radio, please pull over before you go to the show notes. If not, if you're watching this on YouTube, just scroll down. Um, Aditi, thank you so much for doing this. This has been an honor and a pleasure. Thank you so much, Chris. This was this was just awesome to talk to you. So thank you so much for giving me um, and the community and the cause uh, a, a platform. So thank you. Uh, so with that, I want to thank everyone for tuning in. Remember that May is Brain Tumor Awareness Month. As you see with the big old uh, ribbon on the side of the hat here, I've been struggling with a brain tumor for the last two and a half years. I'll be doing a walk a day before uh, Dee Dee's walk up out in Airdrie on June 11th. So if you can, go out June 12th to Airdrie and support a great cause. Uh, and we will be back tomorrow with another great interview. Talk to you later, guys. Thank you.